Lan's sword sprang from his scabbard too fast for Ran's eye to follow. Yet the water hesitated, eyes flickering to Moraine, to Nynaeve. The two women stood well apart. To put himself between either of them and the Forsaken would put him further from the other. Only for a heartbeat the hesitation lasted, but as the warder's feet moved, Agonor raised his hand. It was a scornful gesture, a flipping of his gnarled fingers as if to shoo away a fly. The warder flew backwards through the air as though a huge fist had caught him. With a dull thud, Lan struck the stone arch, hanging there for an instant before dropping in a flaccid heap, his sword lying near his outstretched hands. No! screamed Nynaeve. Be still! Moraine commanded, but before anyone else could move, the Wisdom's knife had left her belt, and she was running toward the Forsaken, her small blade upraised. The light blinds you, she cried, striking at Agonor's chest. The other Forsaken moved like a viper. While her blow still fell, Balfamal's leather-cased hand darted out to seize her chin, fingers sinking into one cheek, while thumb dug into the other, driving blood out with their pressure and raising the flesh in pale ridges. A convulsion racked Nynaeve from head to toe as if she had been cracked like a whip. Her knife dropped uselessly from dangling fingers as Balfamal lifted her by his grip, brought her up to where the leather mask stared into her still quivering face. Her toes spasmed a foot above the ground, flowers rained from her hair. A hell was forgotten the pleasures of the flesh. Agonor's tongue crossed his withered lips, sounding like stone on rough leather. But Balfamal remembers much. <laughs> the laughter of the mask seemed to grow wilder, and the wail that left Nynaeve burned Ran's ears like despair ripped from her living heart. Suddenly, Egwene moved, and Ran saw that she was going to help Nynaeve. Egwene! No! he shouted, but she did not stop. His hand had gone to his sword at Nynaeve's cry, but now he abandoned it and threw himself at Egwene. He fudded into her before she took a third step, carrying them both to the ground. Egwene landed under him with a gasp, immediately thrashing to get three. Others were moving too, he realized. Perrin's axe whirled in his hands and his eyes glowed golden and fierce. Wisdom! Matt howled, the dagger from Shadow Logarth in his fist. No! Ram called. You can't fight the Forsaken! But they ran past him as if they had not heard, their eyes on Nynaeve and the two Forsaken. Agonor glanced at them unconcernedly and smiled. Ran felt the air stir above him like the crack of a giant's whip. Matt and Perrin, not even halfway to the Forsaken, stopped as if they had run into a wall, bounced back to sprawl on the ground. Good, Agonor said. A fitting place for you, if you learn to abase yourself properly and worship us. I might let you live. Hastily, Ran scrabbled to his feet. Perhaps he could not fight the Forsaken. No ordinary human could, but he would not let them believe for a minute that he was groveling before them. He tried to help Egwene up, but she slapped his hands away and stood by herself, angrily brushing off her dress. Matt and Perrin had also stubbornly pushed themselves unsteadily erect. You will learn, Agonor said, if you want to live. Now that I have found what I need, his eyes went to the stone archway, and may take this time to teach you. That shall not be! The green man strode out of the trees with a voice like lightning striking an ancient oak. You do not belong here! Agonor spared him a brief, contemptuous glance. Be gone! Your time is ended, all your kind, but you long since dust. Live what life has left you and be glad you are beneath our notice. This is my place, the green man said, and you shall hurt no living thing here. Bathamel tossed Nynaeve aside like a rag. Like a crumpled rag, she fell, eyes staring, limp as if all her bones had melted. One leather-clad hand lifted, and the green man roared as smoke rose from the vines that wove him. The wind in the trees echoed his pain. Agonor turned back to Rand and the others as if the green man had been dealt with. But one long stride and massive leafy arms wrapped themselves around Athanel, raising him high, crushing him against a chest of thick creepers, black leather mast laughing into hazelnut eyes with anger. Like serpents, Bethnal's arms writhed free, his gloved hands grasping the green man's head as though he'd wrench it off. Flames shot up where those hands touched, vines withering, leaves falling. 
The green man bellowed as thick, dark smoke poured out between the vines of his body. On and on he roared, as if all of him were coming out of his mouth with the smoke that billowed between his lips. Suddenly, Baphomel jerked in the green man's grasp. The Forsaken's hands tried to push him away instead of clutching him. One gloved hand flung wide, and a tiny creeper burst through the black leather. A fungus, such as rings trees in dark shadows of the forest, ringed his arm, sprang from nowhere to full grown, swelling to cover the length of it. Baphomel thrashed, and a shoe's stink weave ripped open his carapace. Lichings dug in their roots and split tiny cracks across the leather of his face. Nettles broke the eyes of his mask. Death's head mushrooms tore open the mouth. The green man threw the Forsaken down. Baphomel twisted and jerked as all the things that grew in dark places, all the things with spores, all the things that, like the dank, swelled and grew, tore cloth and leather and flesh. Was it flesh, seen in that brief moment of verdant rage? To tattered shreds and covered him until only a mound remained, indistinguishable from many in the shaded depths of the green forest, and the mound moved no more than they. With a groan like a limb breaking under too great a weight, the green man crashed to the ground. Half his head was charred black, tendrils of smoke still rose from him like grey creepers. Burned leaves fell from his arm as he painfully stretched out his blackened hand to gently cup an acorn. The earth rumbled as an oak seedling pushed up between his fingers. The green man's head fell, but the seedling reached for the sun, straining. Roots shot out and thickened, delved beneath the ground and rose again, thickened more as they sank. The trunk broadened and stretched upward, bark turning grey and fissured and ancient. Limbs spread and grew heavy, as big as arms, as big as men, who lifted to caress the sky, thick with green leaves dense with acorns. The massive web of roots turned the earth like plows as it spread. The already huge trunk shivered, grew wider, round as a house. Stillness came. An oak that could have stood five hundred years covered the spot where the green man had been, marking the tomb of a legend.